name of the theory, conversation theory, comes from the basis that the interaction or the conversation that you have with yourself, the conversation you have with somebody else, the conversation you have with the machine is basic to understanding the theory and that we will be focusing continuously on this interactive process. Today we'd like to go into the theory for maybe 30, 45 minutes and then look at some applications of conversation theory to educational psychology. What we're particularly looking at is um, three areas, one of which will be in uh, naval warfare, one will be in psychology, and the other will be in tactical operations. So you'll get a feel for how we can use this. ARI has a three-year basic research contract with Dr. Pask, and we will be doing further development of the theory and applications. And this is just the very beginning of the software development that is way behind, behind the theory, so we're just, you're just going to be seeing this at the front end. I'd like to introduce Paul Pangaro here from Pangaro Incorporated and Jeff Nichols from the same, who are here supporting Dr. Casky Project. They are located here in Washington and are our day-to-day -day context with the project while Dr. Casky is only here for a couple of weeks. Hence, we're doing this very condensed series of workshops. Okay, Dr. Casky. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman Ruth. I needed to own my shirt with the microphone. Oh, yeah. um, <coughs> the, um, I think it's come all. Um, there's all these fancy contraptions. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, we're going to test you with our computers? It is reasonable, uh, yes. I am object to being tethered like a goat, uh, which has a halter around its neck with a stake attached to it. Is exactly how I feel with these things. Thank you very much, Chairman Ruth. Ladies and gentlemen, um, last time we talked, as uh, you were saying, a great deal about background, not a great deal about the theory, and I don't know that we need to talk about a great deal about depth of theory now. What I would like to do is in some way to recapitulate perhaps what you've already said, and point out that I guess the one thing I would like to add to it, which is that when we talk about a conversation, we are indeed talking in some sense about a language or a symbolic interaction. But that needn't be verbal. There are plenty of ways of interacting symbolically, for example, ballet, mime, gesture, that we think of interaction languages. Um, some things, some sorts of language are not. Some kinds of formal language do not accommodate the kinds of statements we like to make. For example, asking genuine questions. Which genuine question? What's, what's the usual reply to a genuine question? You ask questions often. Say an interrogation, for example, in the field I know a little about. What's the usual reply? Uh, I submit that, at any rate, in that context, the usual reply is a further implicit question. It may be a sort of answer, but it's seldom a sort of tick or cross, and it may not even be a very initial reply verbally. Uh, did you marry that guy? Or did you steal the diamond in police interrogation? Is seldom answered by anything except a question about really what the police character is looking for. A uh, rather direct question, but you can conceive any question you want. It needn't be that pushful. And the most common reply is, yes, it is to a question. It is indeed another question and a partial answer. And often in eliciting the answer, you have genuinely or vague, in the case of somebody who is concealing what they want or to what they know, to uh, often assist the person concerned by giving supportive information. Because you want to reconstruct the theme, the background, or to elicit the details of that background. 
And in order to get a coherent story out, you have indeed to give some help. Now, this applies equally to questions that are applied to by explaining something, by making an explanation. Frequently, the explanation does not come off pat. And when it does, it's usually only one of several possible explanations, because on the whole, the concepts in our head are made up of many things. For example, how do you drive a motor car of one automobile, one of my favorite ones? How do you ride a bicycle? I'm assuming most of you do. I drive motor cars, drive autos, or ride bicycles. It seems a reasonable assumption. I hope it's not false. Uh, if you're familiar with this skill, uh, then in fact the question is almost absurd because you have, I guess, thousands, millions of ways, any or all of which you use in driving, and every time you make a boober mistake, you find the surroundings uh, too much for your current skill to deal with, you begin to modify that concept. And the reason why, reason why perhaps concepts are continually modified so that questions about them, what's your notion of driving a motor car, what's your concept of, or as I like to think of it, intellectual skill of driving, even if you Imagine driving for yourself, you have an image of an imaginary road, which gives an instance of driving, and driving is almost an automatic or unconscious process. And therefore, the question, how do you drive, is, for an experienced driver, very hard to answer, honestly, isn't it? I mean, what you can do is to exemplify how you drive, and how you exemplify it will depend upon who asks you. If a youngster comes along to learn to drive, then you'll probably give some kind of algorithm about manipulating controls, and about avoiding things, and some sort of algorithm about uh, traffic from the highway code or its equivalent, uh, something about uh, how to deal with certain emergency situations that might arise, a vehicle in front of you uh, suddenly halts, what you do, this kind of thing. But this, in fact, is a reconstruction, and it's a reconstruction made in the context of the youngster. If you're answering to uh, a psychiatrist or to somebody who had a different purpose in mind to find out why, for example, an accident occurred, how do you drive? Uh, well, you would give a different reconstruction. You wouldn't give an algorithm. You would give a series of points of view indicating as far as possible the way in which you were driving, your motor was behaving, and so forth on the occasion of the accident or whatever. Now, this multiplicity of, uh, of concept and the multiplicity of possible replies to questions, many of which are questions what kind of reply you really want, uh, are typical, not untypical, of human dialogue. I might add they're not typical of computing on the whole, uh, where, generally speaking, there is an algorithm. Had I got a machine that was programmed to drive a motor car or ride a bicycle, and were it equipped with a bicycle, I have no doubt it could behave perfectly well and do so if it had an appropriate task to fly along with it. Um, and it would probably be quite easy to determine the very complicated <coughs> algorithm used for this purpose. And there might indeed be reserve algorithms with conditional tests taking one mode or another mode of operation according to certain changes in circumstance. 
Human beings don't work in that orderly fashion, I submit, because when a concept about which you can ask a question, or about which the Nick can ask a question, is learned. It is learned and relearned and continually reused, rehearsed, in such a way that not only are more procedures or whatever programs algorithms that do the same thing added to a bundle that stick together in the fact in the sense that they are not in conflict when applied or executed. Applied is, is perhaps a better word of concept, so in computing one tends to say executed. And when we say I apply a concept to some situation, like recognizing something or other, uh, then, indeed, what is being applied is a whole mass of different procedures. And this way, brains and, and majority of computing machines, uh, in fact, all, at, all, literally all computing machines that are allowed by current construction of such devices, uh, operate in somewhat different ways. And you may expect to capture examples of human thought or human uh, skill uh, or human learning uh, by means of computers and so on, but one can only in the most um, curious way uh, simulate uh, the act of human learning. You can imitate it, sure. You can do it to a different matter. Now, having said that, and having merely made a, a comment that is, I guess, um, pretty obvious to anybody in the area of training, education, and the like, because it's, it's a, almost a platitude of, of working in a classroom or, or working in a training situation, where questions are asked and you ask questions, explanations are given, entities are created or pointed out, as, for example, I make up an electronic circuit, or I point to uh, a chip in that circuit, which is a multiplier, um, or whatever is uh, required by the um, particular doctrine involved, or particular question involved, sorry. Um, so the... Uh, so the, the, this process of accretion goes on, and uh, I would like to sort of diagram it and look at some of the ways in which the diagram can be implemented. Um, now this is it, it's very bad blackboard, and here I'm merely recapitulating what you said earlier with the comment that language is multifaceted, and in that sense when I use the word language, must be like a natural language to accommodate genuine questions, rather than print statement, question mark on the end, genuine command, uh, genuine utterances of an intermediary kind, like inquiries, entreaties, etc., requests, uh, half orders, qualified orders, etc., I'd like to um, add that, of course, this can be in any modality, whatever. And to conceive this process going on as being a process of a bundle of procedures, concept of something, say driving, and I'm going to exemplify this by calling it something particular, is built up by a process going on, which is either memory, or I think I think relearning is a, is a better way. Memory is a, a loaded word. It sometimes means storage. It sometimes means something very much more like what real people do to relearn, recompute, reconstruct. And I do not mean here particularly storage. There is a sense, obviously, in which there is some storage, but the, the word computer memory is a gross misnomer and is particularly misleading. It is, it is storage. 
data storage and uh, a process which regenerated the contents of this by recomputing what was stored, what patterns were stored, or something of this kind, and then could use them. That would be more like uh, human memory. So by that funny arrow at the top, I mean what we call relearn. Sometimes it's called reproduce. That's a dicey word for use in psychology. And we know perfect reproduction is perfect recall. And well, I don't mean it that way. I mean reproduction by relearning and basically the same thing, but maybe in a different way. So that I'm adding to that bundle of operations or procedures I could call a concept of bicycle riding or automobile driving uh, in a manner which does the same thing, but does it a different way around and very often enlarges it. And I think this is a particularly important point in view of some of the findings of various studies. And uh, it may be in this case that it's better to draw this sort of arrow uh, coming in from other columns. Because the reconstruction is not necessarily from the thing itself. I reconstruct bicycle riding, part of that skill, from driving automobiles. A part of driving automobiles may be from my experience as a youngster on a bicycle. It will give me some road sense, which is an essential ingredient of that skill. So, looking at a, a bundle here, to do with a thing I've called symbolically T, I don't mind if it's a perpetual motor skill or whether perceptual motor skill perpetual motor, perceptual motor skill, or whether it is something highly abstract, like a mathematical principle, or uh, something to do with ethics, orders, morals, etc. These are all perfectly reasonable candidates, obviously, for concept. And, and the interaction between people or between bundles of concepts in the same person is many faceted as you'd expect because of, and necessarily so, because of what I believe to be this pervasive ongoing process of rehashing around, either being aware of doing so or, or not. Uh, being aware when you have to give examples, why? Well, because your car skips, and therefore you explicitly have to say, how do I avoid this particular nasty film, black eyes on the road situation I haven't encountered before? The concept of driving is not big enough, it is enlarged. Another one, when you're asked to work as a driving instructor, and you're well aware at this stage of reconstructing for the youngster or for the oldster or whatever the uh, skill uh, exemplifying it, taking a particular form out, not here to enlarge your concept, but to help the other guy learn, ladies or gentlemen who are being so called taught, learn, and give them a concept they previously did not have. To impart it to them. So the question arises: uh, What are these chunks of of uh, concepts like? And the question is a fairly important one because conversation theory claims to deal both with individuals and teams and groups of individuals. And of course, it's fairly easy to say, "All right, I've got a couple of characters." A and B, which we think of as brains, including other organs, uh, bags filled with concepts, and having concepts relearned or recomputed or 
reconstructed or reproduced, and modified by production of one sort or another. And it's easy enough to imagine a situation of exchange between A and B. Uh, and there's an assumption here that A and B are encompassed in a couple of different brains, and it's not too difficult to imagine a many-one situation where one person is talking to several, or several are talking to one another, as in group instruction or group decision. Um, another case, however, occurs, namely the case in which A and B are enclosed in the same brain. This is the one that Ruth was pointing out uh, as well. And it's be obtained by taking a sort of brain box and looking at debate internally, talking to oneself without necessarily verbalizing it, maybe in some other kind of imagery or some other kind of mental process going on, doesn't much matter. And it's a bit more difficult to see how you deal with that. See, it would be easy, uh, as it were, to take a couple of people which are now replaced by completing, I hope, visibly their brain boxes and somehow to tap what's going on in between them. Okay, you, for example, you gentlemen, or why not you and you know, gentlemen, debate between you. I can tell them to remain silent and overlook your interaction. It may be the case that you're both knowledgeable about something and you exchange ideas, you share concepts. It may be that you share concepts because you, ma'am, are an expert, sir, and you, sir, are, are a novice in, in respect to some skill which you is called T and you want to learn about. But in doing so, I am tapping what appears to be going on anyhow, and I may provide, and people like Piaget and others would provide, if you were youngsters, or an interviewer often does, something such as a product, or a puzzle, or a logo computer for youngsters learning mathematics, as standing in the middle to focus the dialogue, to focus the debate. And you could have this thing here. I would call it an interface, just to be, um, you know, easy about it. I am not really concerned what it is, as long as it's something in which you can exemplify what you're discussing. It might be a collection of different canned goods in an interview. It might be, uh, in the case of Piaget, the famous water jars or something of this kind. Or, in the case of Logo, would be a bit of a difference. I think it makes it much richer. Here we'd have a computing machine on which you could not only discuss and make concepts about objects like tin goods or something, but you could also answer specific how questions. Say, I have a method for making this object, which exemplifies it isn't all of my methods for doing it, but which exemplifies uh, how I do it. And furthermore, you can add to the examples, i.e. you'd write, in this case, a model which was a program, and cause it to be executed to make a logo turtle move around the floor. Uh, now, that's a fairly easy one to cope with. Of course, the other situation, where I'm going to coalesce these brains and is the only one that really applies to individual learning. I can't stick a probe very easily into your brain, and even if I could, I don't know if there's much use to do so. And uh, here we have this situation where we can't hear the debate going on normally. Uh, and an interface like the supply of different goods, compared and contrasted, or the logo 
machine on which I can make programs in turn cause a turtle to execute geometrical patterns. I, I can't put that inside and somehow tap this dialog, but what I can do is to use that same interface, whether it be the canned goods or the logger machine, and um, pull out what I like to think of as threads of cognition which are normally private and normally left on your own. You're just thinking about the thing, reading the book, perhaps. Uh, maybe playing in a very esoteric manner or something, but you might even be doing anything at all, just sitting there thinking. And the intention here of conversation theory is to regard this still as a conversation, which normally is ongoing and indeed is a part of this reconstructive process uh, of how we really learn in a, a latent manner after tuition is over. We relearn, think over, try and reconstruct. But we can pull out uh, some of that and about, in fact, as much as we can pull out of a, a conversation between people if there is an interface task of some sort, which on the one hand is attractive, and on the other hand is useful, so that in fact it is easier for people, or more facile for people, by supplying some sort of prop of whatever kind uh, outside, and we can capture this much, capture in literally the case, this much as much as a certain amount, in fact nearly all, I submit, under circumstances which can be set up. Now, I'd like now to take that image and go to this other board where I've drawn stuff up, and I hope make sense of what in conversation theory at least is hard valued, very firm, very sure psychological data. And the data, of course, does consist in, in behaviors, one sort or another. If they're verbal, it often a question you want questions that we in a natural language is ambiguous. What is really meant by these words if they are uttered genuinely. Uh, so we can if necessary you can if necessary uh, provide a channel for interaction which is entirely mechanical. Now, I'm the last person, please, to say this is the only way of investigating things. I believe that, for example, if you acted yourself as an interface between two aspects of somebody, as you do with why I mentioned interrogation as a very good, as a very good case to obtain intelligence, you're actually using a couple of aspects, of moral independent aspects, of somebody being interrogated. And the interrogator is acting very largely as a person, more efficient in fact than a device perhaps, whereby you can look at this comparison and contrast between usually uh, the concealer and the felon. And you weigh them up, and of course the criminal guy, assuming he is a criminal, <laughs> is weighing them up too. Now, on the other hand, in cases where we don't use a person, and cases there are cases where it's better not to use a person, um, are um, replaced by having uh, an interview. Now, let's get a few bits down here. T is just a generic name for any concept. Um, this is one of a whole lot of concepts inside a person, or else a thing like A or B inside one head. 
And the intention of this diagram, of drawing it in this way and of doing all this spiel, is to make it, I hope, clear that although a great deal of use is made of machinery, I believe with value in conversation theory, the participants in a conversation do not talk to the machine in the sense of asking it real questions and they give instructions like the Logo Turtle is instructed to execute a program and to have a program built and contain a program and to execute it. They don't talk to them in the sense that they would talk to somebody else, they talk to themselves through machines and I couldn't emphasize this too strongly. Otherwise I think as education guys, anyhow, you would shoot me down straight away in the sense that it is clearly wrong. Uh, it's the whole philosophy of bad CAI rather than good uh, computer aided uh, learning or instruction or whatever. Uh, the, the whole notion that you're talking to a machine and the machine is talking to you. The machine is a store of data. In it, which may facilitate a great deal of talking to yourself, and it may contain means whereby, and should contain means in this case, whereby it's possible to pull out those threads of cognition from inside your head into an appropriate interface. Now, in this case, we have um, a picture of somebody who. is one representative or one perspective, doesn't matter, and the same thing as that applies to B. Now, this operation here is what I call con A of T. I call it con A of T as shorthand on the board because it's quite a convenient way of representing A's personal concept of, say, motor driving or whatever. And I'll put down here on B oh, sorry, notation. When it is applied, it either gives rise to sort of internal image here. Or else it's possible that it gives rise to a behavior. And if it gives rise to a behavior, it can make, and it can sense the making of, a model. So I call this a model at the logo machine belonging to one of the participants. And likewise, in the case of B, Con B of T on execution gives rise to some sort of image or internal behavior, intellectual behavior, or else to an external behavior, amongst which could be another logo program or L model. And this process can be sensed, interrupted, etc., altered, modified, put right, perhaps even. And furthermore, well, there may be information available, data available, which is very useful in that respect. Uh, now, the programs themselves, just like these models, just like these concepts, can be executed to give rise to a behavior, movement of the turtle, in the case of a logo example, in case this be a logo machine. In case it be a simulation of the sort that we'll look at later, uh, then it is indeed the execution of moves in the vehicles of that simulation. And the moves themselves are the behaviors produced. They're examples of what the commander or commanders might imagine being done, or a person learning to be a commander will have one bit of the brain weighing up one alternative with another alternative. Okay, so the role of the simulation is this is the simulation here, and this is the operation of the simulation here. 
And these things may either be in different guys in a team, or they may be in one head, and the process I'm talking about are pulled out as behaviors that exteriorize what would normally be hidden from sight. Now, of course, that first picture suggests that things are relearned, and I'm going to suppose that, indeed, we call the generic term the productive and reproductive operations of A, the relearning a memory. And I don't mean it, however, in the form of stockage. And the same up here, uh, that given this much, you can now produce new ones. And you can get concepts from other concepts. So the simplest sort of sharing operation would be for A and B to interact. OK, A and B to interact via an interface in which their interaction could be set down, sensed, so behavior, and duly recorded. Um, supposing I uh, give the following paradigm case. Supposing that it is a case of adding to an existing concept, which a lot of learning is. The, we have already got some idea, for example, about how to uh, drive around vessels B, L, and U in, in that simulation. Uh, we have already got some tactics and strategies to use so we can build certain kinds of model uh, and cause them to be executed as commander in that command situation. Uh, on the other hand, there's either another commander who is a part of a group or team learning, or else there's another hypothesis up here about how punks or whatever it may be might be played and what would be good rules, good tactics, uh, good strategies, and so on. So try to indicate this by saying, OK, ab initio, just to begin with, uh, this concept of T here, concept of driving the vehicle, making a lot of your program, whatever, is derived from concepts of P and Q in the case of, of Ms. A. And in the case of Mr. B, it's obtained from R uh, and S. Now, a hard-valued event will involve a hard-valued psychological event which measurements are based in this particular, with this particular interactionist position, um, is obtained as follows. Initially, we have a state of affairs in which A uh, can construct a T, a certain concept, from certain preliminaries. For example, in the case of the simulation, can do detection by the operation of pinging, which is a rather unwise operation because it sends a sonar signal out and lets your presence be known. But it does reveal things in the neighborhood. Uh, then, on the other hand, there's another aspect which does detection of enemy vessels by another means, by another means, by the crossing of vector lines, which give actually uncertain information that there certainly may be something at the intersections. Uh, another, another method of driving the BLU vessels in one commander's fleet against the vessels called G, R, and A. Um, so initially you've got, OK, direct detection. And you're going to learn, you've got a hypothesis about, or you're going to learn about, or somebody else has a hypothesis about, or has a skill in indirect detection. Well, how do we detect that? We look at the why questions attached to the how questions, which are answered by tactics and the like. And you question the present bundle of tactics, either by assembling them into a strategy of some sort, or by 
quite often simply adding to the repertoire of tactics so that they become coherent with each other in your uh, commander's head. So the situation we have to sense is that Miss A initially built T from P and Q, and Mr. B initially built T from, and that's a different T, it's a T belonging to B, B's concept of a commander, uh, from R and S, which are the components of indirect detection, we sense that there is an interchange in which, first of all, they retain their previous capability, as betokened by the fact they can produce procedures that work exemplifying outside, exemplifying their own concept. Uh, they can continue to produce them in respect to T, this guy from P and Q and this guy from R and S. After the transaction, which is a hard-valued event, they're still able to do T and make things do the behaviors of a T, a fleet in this case, or and, sorry, not or, and, they can also, both of them, have an ability to do something else, which I will indicate by saying that Ms. A has acquired a concept of uh, prime, S prime construction, and construct T from R prime and S prime, components of, indi of indirect detection, and that this guy, whether it be Mr. B or another bit of the same brain, uh, can do P prime and Q prime, which is something fresh known about direct detection, like the fact it gives away, sir. Good. Could I ask that you redraw the relation of the T's and the P's and the Q's on a separate board? It's getting a little lost there, and if you could uh -huh. just once more uh, write how T is derived in one case in A from P and Q and in the okay, other Okay, well, one. may I not do it on this? Perhaps it would be easier. Um, just take it, that briefly yeah, into Well, I don't want the whole diagram, do I? Just as the just reconstruction bit. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, look at this con A T. Okay. Uh, in this case, A is the concept, uh, current concept. Well, of, the board a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, it doesn't become invisible. I'm too apologizing. How about that? How about, folks, can you see the writing all right, please? Mm -hmm. uh, and typically, this is made by A out of con P A and con Q A. And when it's made, it can be executed or applied. Okay. Sorry. Apologies. To apologize, it goes into T's, A's concept of T. A's behavior of T or A's image of T. Now, this may be exemplified the execution may be exemplified by model made by A, which on execution in the machine, in other words, the ships are given certain motions, gives rise to a behavior exemplifying that usually very broad concept of command inside the machinery rather than inside the um, um, rather than inside the head, it's inside the actual simulation now. So the operation goes on, is displayed. And it's no different from an exercise of some sort, a dynamic exercise, with answering a how question as well as answering a what is it to your cross type inquiry. Uh, and or in the case of B, uh, the same sort of thing occurs, excepting that con B T, which on execution gives rise to T 
T's concept, sorry, B's concept of command, TB, uh, can also produce on execution model, model B, uh, which can be similarly executed in the simulation, in Tinsler if necessary, to exemplify a notion of command in certain circumstances. Now, this P, uh, con A, P is con, uh, A's concept of P and A's concept of Q in the example stand for the act of pinging and the consequence of pinging as a means of detection of enemy vessels. And it's a perfectly good uh, example. I use it because it's relevant to one of the demos. And uh, in the case of uh, B, sorry, I always get notations wrong, sorry. I wrote A up there. I should have written B, do apologize. That's the application. Uh, was obtained pre 